television to be bombarded with news about food security in Africa and the question around is genetically modified foods a solution to the conversation around food security. At the heart of this debate is the conversation on, rather is the debate on genetically modified foods are a means for global oligarchs to colonize African food systems. Debating in this debate is Mary Hill High School, the senior team, versus Nova Pioneer Tattoo Boys, the senior team. I'll read the motion again. Genetically modified foods are a means for global oligarchs to colonize African food system. Team proposition, first speaker, you have three minutes. You will always be a slave to the hand that feeds you. My name is Victor Cholia Pamo, here to strongly propose a motion that states that genetically modified foods are a mean for global oligarchs to colonize African food systems. So first of all, what is genetically modified foods? These are foods that have their DNA changed from other plants and use, they have their D DNA changed from other plants and animals. So that means they have been, their properties and composition has been changed and altered and modified to meet and become more versatile. Secondly, to my second uh, definition, what are global oligarchs? Oligarchs, first of all, are a group of people who control and run a particular sector or organ organization. First of all, they mainly control the political and economical aspects. So these are people in this said aspect and sector that they deal with have full control of the whole area and whatever runs in that sector, they have full control of, over it. So in this motion, we deal with farms that have a monopoly control and have subsistence control over the resources, production, consumption, and the waste management of this said uh, sector. Toward my, sec my third definition, what are African food systems? First of all, what are food systems? These are as all steps involved in the food creation, including production, processing, distribution, consumption, and the waste management of these things. And in African food sy systems, it enables people to have a viable and sustainable for small-scale farmers in Africa to be able to be able to meet the competition and enter these said markets. So why do I say that oligarchs, global oligarchs, will lead to colonization, will lead to de dependency of the African people on these said oligarchs? First of all, we understand that these oligarchs are not coming just to give the, ge ge the gen genetically modified foods to these people. They are coming to run the production, the distribution, and the consumption, as well as the waste management. So they are coming to take over the whole food system and the whole food sector. They are not coming to just give one edge. They are not coming for one specific area, but they are coming to control the food sector. So how will you be able, how, will you, how do you stand here and say that they will not colonize us when they are taking the whole, they are taking control over this whole sector? First of all, to my first point, it says that these said oligarchs have significant financial and political powers, and they can use them to dominate these small-scale small -scale farmers in this said field. First of all, the reason why I say they'll use it to dominate because they're in the similar market. When this said company, such as one, one company is called Doe, Doe from the United States of America has come here and has come like as a foreign in investor. They have come as a foreign investor and they might say that uh, the country will welcome them and they'll be into this market. But the fact is, comp competing with these small, small scale farmers, the truth is they have more resources, more opportunities, more power and capability to meet this market. That's why they will have more dominance over these said markets, diminishing the small, small scale farmers. And I would like to just debrief on colon colonize. Colonize is to take control and to inflict on other people, other countries, your religion, your economics, and other languages. But now, that's not what, what we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with neocolonialism. That is when a developed country comes and takes over another developed country. Thank you very much. Team opposition, first speaker, you have three minutes. Why should GMOs be given a chance in Africa? Why should these transgenic crops be given a chance to grow in our African land? Kalunde Darling, the Mary Hill Girls High School, ecstatic to oppose the motion, genetically modified foods are a means for global oligarchs to colonize the African food system. I agree with the first speaker's definition. So on to my first point. Generally, a high percentage of genetically modified organisms are plants, which directly translate to our crops, right? So these cr genetically modified crops are highly resistant to pests. Now we have a big culprit here, which are the stem borers. Stem borers are pests that attack the maize crop. So these stem borers are responsible for a loss of 400,000 tons of maize in Kenya, which accounts to 14% of the total maize produced annually.
BT maize is an example of uh, this genetically modified maize. And BT is a bacteria that is res resistant to this pest. So in recurring years, we see that Kenya had felt the pinch of these stem borers, whereby Kenya had nearly accepted domestically producing and also importing genetically modified maize, which would have aided 1.5 Kenyans who were suffering from acute hunger at the time. Moving on, is it not common knowledge that the population of Africa is continuing to grow? So as a result, more forests are being cleared so that we can be able to house these people. Therefore, the aspect of deforestation comes in. We do know that GMOs are able to grow under harsh conditions. And according to the SDGs, which I believe you know are the Sustainable Development Goals, zero hunger is to be achieved by 2030. Therefore, GMOs are helping us to bridge this problem. I hope you're moving with me. So I'd call this killing two birds with one stone. Why? Because by preserving our forests, we at the same time decrease global warming in the atmosphere. Why? For those who do geography, we do know that forests are able to, you know, reduce the carbon four oxide levels in the atmosphere. And we know that carbon four oxide levels are, okay, they can increase the global warming and, uh, you know, destroy the ozone layer. So, as we all know, global warming is, on, is not only a problem facing our continent, but also the world in general. But you see, global warming catalyzes climate change. Let's take an example of long rains that are supposed to take, okay, happen during, you know, March, April, and May, meaning they will be moved to a much later time. Therefore, this will disrupt the agricultural calendar. And we do know that agriculture is the backbone of Africa, which is our motherland, our continent. Therefore, what am I trying to say? Join me, Kalunda Darling from the Mary Hill Girls High School, a smart African in trying to figure out ways to effectively feed our continent. So. Second speaker, team proposition, you have three minutes. My name is Hilary Dede, and I am here from Nova Pioneer Boys to strongly propose a motion that has been set on the table for us today. Now, I'd just like to reiterate a few things. Um, the main thing that they have come here and talked about how, um, <clears throat> actually, I'd like to start to the point, actually. So the reason why we believe that these crops, these genetically modified crops, would lead to colonize, right, that the global oligarchs are using them to colonize the country, is because if you look at the long-term effects, it will lead to the fact that Africa cannot stand on its feet alone. Now, what do I mean, right? First of all, if you look at the way that these GMFs are made, right, they are introducing a new gene. Now, you come in and you take a maize plant that has been genetically modified in the labs, and then you bring it to somewhere where they produce maize, right? You plant it. What happens? you're destroying the economical system, right? Now, what happens? That means you're bringing in new genes to the food pyramid, right? What happens? 10, 20 years down the line, then that entire food pyramid, that entire food system over there has been destroyed. Meaning, in 15, 20 years, we will be unable to plant our own crops, meaning we will have to go to this GMFs, right? Meaning we'll have to go to these global oligarchs for money, for all of these things, leading to us depending on them. And what does that mean? Colonization. And what, and a, a, a quote that was once told to me was, control the food, control the people. What do I mean by that? If you look at a certain dictators throughout history, right, you see that, uh, at the beginning of the power, no matter what they did, the people are okay. Why? Because they could bring food for the people. Now, I'd like to give you an example. Hastings Banda, who was a dictator of Malawi from 1966 to 1994, right? What happened? He stayed in power for all of that time, but in 1991, the dissidents and the people started writing more. Why? Because there was food shortage. What does that mean? The people will be happy as long as you give them food. Meaning if someone can control the food systems, they can control us. Meaning that we'll get colonized. Meaning that we'll have to depend on them. Meaning that we cannot do anything. Meaning what the opposition wants us to do is to return to 60, 70 years ago when we were under the complete dependency of all of these other global oligarchs. They want us to return to the point where DRC and Coke and Congo was still a part of King Leopold II's backyard. 
Now and then we also like to talk about the fact that if you look at it statistically, Africa by itself cannot make sustainable ge uh, genetically modified foods. What do I mean by this? The cost of genetically modified foods, just to start it, is $10,000. How much is that in Kenyan shillings? In, Afri in Kenyan shillings, it's 13 million, right? In Zimbabwean currency, it's 2 million. In Congolese francs, it's 205 million. And not just to start it, now to actually develop it and make it better for ourselves, it will cost $115 million, which we cannot have. Meaning that if we want to continue living and eating and giving all of these foods on the table, we'll have to depend on them. Depend on the global oligarchs, leading to colonialism. Thank you. Second speaker, team opposition, you have three minutes. I'm standing here to strongly oppose the motion at hand. To my worthy opponents, I'd like to appreciate the fact that you've stated that Africa cannot stand on its own. Thank you for that. So, you're talking about genetically modified foods destroying the genes of Africa's original foods. And let me ask you something. Africa, you've been growing your original foods like since forever. And right now, you're still facing the same problems. We are bringing a solution, a solution to increase your yields by introducing new genes. That is what we are talking about. On to my first point. Genetically modified foods have longer shelf life compared to our African's tradi African traditional foods. What am I saying? These foods can stay for long without going bad. Food is available, trust me. And luckily, when we are viewing the transportation of these foods, there is a challenge, especially in Africa, where we have an accessible area, where we have low, poor shelf life of foods. James Rogers, a scientist, discovered a way to increase the shelf life of foods, mostly tomatoes, from at least two times to five times. This is a solution, and progress is a necessity in Africa. And we are bringing solutions to smart Africans, trust me. Two. Genetically modified foods help to preserve soil and water. This is because they do not need large tracts of land. They are also modified to withstand arid and semi-arid conditions. What am I saying? They do not need water for irrigation. This will help us preserve African land because while the traditional foods need large tracts of land, the genetically modified foods need small, need small tracts of land, but at the same time produces high yields. Yes, progress is essential in Africa. And we are here to introduce smart solutions to you, the smart Africans. Other than that, genetically modified foods protect crops from extinction. How can you define a present without a past? A lot of foods we are taking today are products of, so of soil original sources. Genetically modifi genetic modification technology is able to interbreed the crops that are almost extinct for continuity. This enables us to preserve our indigenous crops which would have grown, gone extinct with progress as a necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a solution we are bringing to Africa, the smart Africa. Now, this is not a way to colonize Africa, trust me. We are not coming here, to, the global oligarchs are not coming here to colonize the African food system. It's about time Africans you accepted that you needed help because yes, you need it and that is a fact that cannot be disputed. And the help is here with us. This is not a way to colonize the African food system but rather a way to aid the African food system. And with that, I rest my case. position has been tasked with the question of, in this day and age of independent bodies like the UN and UNEP, what is to guarantee that colonization can actually take place in Africa again at their watch? Team opposition have been staged with a question on, given that in the African continent, white settlers came with their own farming techniques and seeds and things of that nature, what is to guarantee that GMO is not another form of colonization? <laughs> Team proposition, third speaker, you have three minutes on stage. In Europe, first, and now America, elected men have taken it upon themselves to indebt their people to create an atmosphere of dependency. And why? 
for their own selfish needs to increase their own personal power. This was said by His Holiness, Pope Francis. With that being said, my name is Michael Solomon Onyango, and I'm going to be the third proposition speaker for our side. I'll begin with the question that was given by the student from Mangu. How exactly does colonization happen when all these independent bodies are all present here? They protect us from political colonization. That's through our language, cultural, and religion. Someone can't impose those things on another country. However, they do not protect us from economic exploitation. A country can come here acting as messiahs, acting as people to help us, or giving some sort of ideal that Africans can't handle the situations on their own. And they start giving ideas, they start giving policies and regulations that look like they're trying to benefit the Africans at large, but in real sense, they're pseudo beliefs that are trying to put us back in our place where we belong. That is how it will happen, through indirect colonization. With that being said, I'll move on to my rebuttals. They said agriculture is the backbone of our continent, and that's exactly why we're against foreign global oligarchs being involved in those particular activities. My first point, you will lose control over the food supply as small farmers and communities are forced to rely on other oligarchs for seed inputs and other inputs. Loss of autonomy. This is the right or condition of self-government. When the government becomes a figurehead because global oligarchs have come and completely taken over the economic sector of a country, the country becomes in a state of dependency. Why? Because if the government has no obligation or the government is no longer in full control of the food supply because other people have taken dominance, that is colonialism. It doesn't have to have them coming here and declaring Kenya a, a, a protectorate or a colony as long as they have full control over us economically. That is still a problem and that is a problem we need to solve right now. And I would like to tell you that there are three aspects of colonialism. Breaking down solution and dependency. That's what GMFs are doing. They are breaking down the African cultures that have been set there of hard work and perseverance. They're giving us a fake solution that looks like the solution to all our problems. And by doing that, they're creating a sense of dependency, which we have been trying to fight since the days of Tom Boyer, since the days of Kwame Nkrumah, and since, since the days of Patrice Lumumba. Furthermore, they undermine traditional knowledge and practices. Why is this a problem? Cultural heritage is lost, and there's breakdown in social cohesion. My ancestors emphasized hard work, perseverance, and dedication in whatever you do. These policies that the foreign oligarchs will bring will emphasize aspects of dependency, complacency, and complaining to every single person every chance they get. Let us rise in Africa. Just as Martin Luther King had a dream, I have a dream for Africa too, that one day we'll sit amongst each other and solve the problems within our own territories and boundaries, and only then will our ancestors be at peace. Thank you. Third speaker from Team Opposition, you have three minutes. Even without my specs, I can clearly see that my dear sons here are refusing development. They claim that we do not. We claim that. They want to claim that we want to return to the 60 and 70 years era, yet they're the ones insisting on the non-GMOs which were used in the 60 and 70 years era. Now to answer my question, darling, let me tell you something. Let me sharpen your knowledge on history. According to history, yes, I do agree with you that foods, they did, the white settlers did introduce the foods, but the foods did not lead to colonization. The main major thing that led to the colonization was the raw materials. The food actually led to agrarian revolution. If you read your Kelby history or your evolving world, you'll be able to realize that agrarian revolution is the development of agriculture. It led to the development of agriculture, not colonization. Now, to go to my rebuttling, we are getting modernized, we are getting mechanized, and I am a smart girl, therefore, I prefer to work smart than work hard, like the way it has been done over the years by the non-GMO farmers, and no change or nothing has been changed to alleviate, has been seen to alleviate the situation of the African food system. People are still hungry. Seems my tall sons are not seeing that people are still hungry when we are using these non-GMOs. So what am I saying? For me, I believe that the global population 
the current African population is 1.34 billion currently. 140 million of this 1.34 billion are already suffering from world hunger. They're already chronically hungry. With using these non-GMOs, we have 140 million who are chronically hungry. But if I decide to welcome you to my land of genetically modified foods, genetically modified foods will increase the yields. Increasing the yields, this is in the sense that genetically modified foods are have a 12% are 12 larger or have 12% larger grains than the non-genetically modified foods, as suggested by my tall sons. So we proceed. So I want to pose a question to them. By 2050, the African population will be 2.5 billion. An extra 1.16 billion compared to the current. So with your non-GMOs, how are you planning to curb this 1.16 billion? How are you planning to feed them with your non-GMOs, my dear sons? So I welcome you again to my land of genetically modified foods. To, comp to finish up, genetically modified foods lower the cholesterol level in your body in the sense that they contain, they can reduce a certain type of a certain type of fat known as LPA. This LPA increases the cholesterol level in your body. The minute it increases the cholesterol body, it increases the risk of you getting sick. Increasing the risk of you getting sick will increase the body fat in your body. Me, join me in my flat tummy energy as I reduce the cholesterol bodies and as I reduce the cholesterol levels with my genetically modified organisms, I can see my tall sons are quite unfit. So kindly let us move into genetically modified. Closing remarks, we'll be taking from team proposition, you have one minute. As Elias said, my name is Michael Solomon and I'll be giving the final submission from the proposition side. First and foremost, the third speaker said food did not lead to colonization. However, according to a report by UNESCO, stated that sub-Saharan countries, before they became colonies, 65% of the population could feed themselves and sustain themselves with enough food to eat. After colonization, th that number dropped to 30%. This is because when they came here, they destroyed our food systems, they destroyed, uh, they destroyed our means of making a living just so they could control us completely. Maybe you should have spent more time doing research and calling us your sons, and your argument would have been, have been that pathetic. Apart from that, there's also the issue of people are still hungry. Let me tell you something for a fact. Most of the people in Africa are hungry, not because we're not doing work, but not because of other issues. The main problem is that our leaders are not doing what they're supposed to do. It has nothing to do with GMFs. Therefore, that point is null and void. And what is our solution? Our solution is dependency amongst each other, depending on different Af African countries coming together within ourselves and coming to a viable solution, which maybe you should try and maybe your argument would have been better. However, I would like to conclude the stage by saying one last question to the opposition side. How does it feel to lose to your sons? Apart from that, I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Team opposition, you have one minute to make your closing remark. My dear sons, I believe I trained you better not to argue with your mother. Therefore, what I preferably, I prefer to genetically modified foods as a vaccine for this species, except that it is encoded into their genes and not into their immune system. So, here's clearly come and told me to do more research. My history student, according to my Kelby history, it says, yes, I do not, I, yeah, yes, food was a part of, the, of this global countries to call, as a part of it to colonize us. But the major thing was the raw materials. When food was brought, then can you explain to me what agrarian revolution actually is? When these foods were brought, it led to the Africans being more, more, more mechanized on their food system. So initially and eventually, Eventually, the introduction of the Western foods did not lead to colonization. It actually helped the Africans. Now to conclude, I do not know how it feels to lose because I'm not prone to losing. I wish you all the best, my dear sons, and I urge you to respect your mother more. Thank you.
all I want to say to Nova, congratulations, you have done justice to this motion. Uh, and I remember Hillary as well, very passionate. You almost took the stage away, I mean, uh, with the reasonings. And I could feel what you're talking about as well, as well as uh, Michael, right? Standing out as well, very well. And even the first speaker, that's Simon. Uh, no, no, not Simon. Uh, that should be Victor as well. So well done as well. To the girls, very good examples, advantages of why we need to embrace GMOs. Kanye, very good debate as well. So congratulations. I can't wait as well for the surprise results. Mary Hill Girls High School, the judges have awarded you 73.3%. A round of applause. Nova Pioneer Tattoo Boys School, the judges have awarded you 73%. Round of applause, please, for Nova. <laughs> Therefore, the winners of this debate are Mary Hill Girls High School with 73.3%. <laughs> Given that it was a tight, it was a tight one, this one. Therefore, um, we have come to the end of this debate. And until next time, here from the debate circle, it is goodbye from us. Mm -hmm.